economy, the issue of crime, criminality, and the Caribbean meal. Well, so often we've spoken about the endangered youth, the at-risk young man who succumbs to gang violence, who would become a statistic, who as time progresses will become that group of underserved youth, the at-risk communities. Well, there are a group of university professors who are visiting and they're studying, speaking, and hoping to advance the conversation of masculinity crime, and also global partnerships. Jennifer Freeman and Austin Gailey are here to tell us a little bit more about their work and how they hope to change the conversation. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank Good you morning. so much for having us. Thank you. Now, let me start with you, Austin. Crime and masculinity. That's an interesting topic. How did you first, when we talk about crime and masculinity, is it only men that are guilty of crimes? Uh, no, not, not at all. Um, I think, you know, masculinity, we don't often think of it this way, but it's something that um, not just men hold. A lot of, you know, us, we all hold elements of masculine energy, but um, obviously crime is committed by, you know, people of all identities. But what we're finding is that there's often an association between uh, masculinity and violence more so than femininity in a lot of cases. When I say masculinity, what am I referring to? Because most times when you hear of a masculine attitude, you think macho and the Caribbean male and cultural. Right. Um, great question. So I think really it's sort of thinking of what are the roles that have sort of been imposed on men oftentimes in society. So the socialization, if you will. So almost a standard or a benchmark that men have been told that they need to live up to in order to be masculine or to be that standard of manhood in a sense. So. And why did you decide to take this route of study? Uh, well, for me, it's very personal. I mean, my story and my journey of how I came to be in this work has often been uh, making mistakes and learning from them. So a lot of the people that work in this field have um, been a part of certain groups. So throughout my journey, I've found myself in lots of spaces of what we often consider to be toxic masculinity or hyper masculinity. So very vigilant, dominant male spaces. So being a veteran, having a life and a story before that, um, I've come to sort of understand my own journey and how it's impacted me uh, in both negative and in positive ways. But now I seek to kind of redefine that in a healthier way. What is toxic masculinity? Well, I think that's a term that's been circulated a lot recently, and a lot of people, um, I think, take it and hear it in an offensive way, but really I think it's examining what are some of the traditional ways, the ways we've been thought to, or taught to think of masculinity in ways that are often damaging to relationships. So, for example, um, if I'm in a relationship and I'm asserting my dominance over somebody simply because they're um, their gender is different than mine, or they're a woman, um, that in many ways is toxic because it's kind of ignoring the fact that there's equality amongst us and I'm kind of creating that power dynamic in a sense. So there's a number of ways to kind of, I think, define that and how that plays out. So, When does the man uh, become more susceptible to a life of criminality well, or embracing the criminal elements? Um, I, th I think there's a lot of different angles to that, but my focus has really been seeking to understand what is the role of trauma in one's household, in one's community, in one's society. So a lot of the um, issues originate from a lot of the work that I've done and, and met with various people um, at home. So some sort of domestic abuse, um, verbally, physically, sexually, and how those sort of repressed feelings, because as those sort of um, roles that are imposed on men, we say, well, you're, you're supposed to be numb to emotion. You're not allowed to feel. To do that somehow subverts your masculinity. And so once those feelings are repressed over time, we're seeing those sort of manifest in very violent ways over the course of one's life. Now, Jennifer, you're taking a different approach in this collaboration. You're getting global partnership and global collaboration with this topic. How has that been working? Are people understanding that we need to get men to understand their emotions to combat violence? There is actually a lot of, of work being done in different countries around the world looking specifically at that issue. A lot of times, as you know, governments tend to focus on, okay, if we have issues of criminality, which exist everywhere in the world, um, what are the factors driving that and how can we address it? And yet gender often gets left out of the equation. So in my work, looking at how 
um, local actors, one of the reasons I'm in Trinidad and Tobago looking at this is because you have such a vibrant civil society that's working on issues of masculinity, gender, um, criminality in general. And so looking at how those who are seeking to support that, whether that's international donors or the government, can do a better job of really partnering with those civil society organizations and addressing some of the things that Austin was saying about what the root causes might be. I know yesterday you had the event with civil society jumping up to say, let's do this, let's take this cause one step further. Yes, they were they were phenomenal. It was great to meet them and they, they really came together. I mean, like I said, a lot of them have been working in this space for decades. Um, and likewise, a lot of members of the diplomatic and donor community were present there, equally committed. And so we were really saying, okay, if everybody's committed to solving this problem together, how can we best go about that? So this is part, my work is part of an international campaign that the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice is leading around trying to transform some of those relationships and in particular forefronting the work of women peace leaders who often don't have kind of the same level of decision making even though they're very very active in civil society I hear they're active here in government as well and really looking at kind of when we look at those power dynamics how can we make sure women's voices are being included along with men's is it more difficult for women's voice to be heard in <laughs> peace in peacekeeping uh, mediation and discussions and even negotiations historically it sure has been we have very, very low levels of participation. Um, there's a huge body of research that shows when, when, meaning, when women are meaningfully included in that decision making, it actually has better peace impacts in the country, more sustainable development, um, better economic prosperity, all those kinds of social issues really get dealt with because you're talking to the whole of society. And yet, for example, in peace negotiations, we only have 3.7% of negotiators are women. So still trying to trip that tide. Specifically getting a woman to speak on masculinity. How does that work out? Well, we had a forum the other night that, that Austin um, was working on as well. Um, and it was, it was both women and men in the room. And it was, it was really interesting to see kind of how um, those voices could come together with their different perspectives. Men speaking about their own experiences of, of masculinity and how they see masculinities. And then the women contributing kind of a complementary view in terms of what they see in terms of both the challenges and maybe, you know, how to move societies forward. And I have to emphasize this, this challenge, these dynamics exist in every society with their own nuance and context. The cultural relevance of this discussion. We take a short break. When we come back, the Caribbean male, do they understand that it's okay, it's a cry? Stay with us. Masculinity and crime. We are trying to combat the crime situation on all fronts in this country. Now it's taking the conversation to a different level, a different approach. We normally speak about more police, more soldiers, and getting to lockdowns, and that, that's the tone of the conversation. What about the softer skills? You know, Austin, the conversation about the Caribbean meal. So a lot of people will wonder, okay, are you aware of the cultural relevance of the macho Caribbean male and the fact is that a man is, a man is, that's just who he is. That's what we pressure our men to be. So to come and say, it's okay to express your feelings, it's okay to do that, it's breaking from the culturally accepted norm. How are you gonna tell them that we need to do this? Uh, that's a great question. And it's not, a, it's not one that happens overnight. Um, what, we, what we find is that like, this is a process. It's one that we have to slowly find ways to invite people into the conversations. And I don't think there's a better way to do it than to have community-centered efforts. So with, when you have people who are charismatic figures, role models in, in the society, um, and oftentimes people look at them and they represent what is perceived to be that standard of manhood, when they can come and invite people into that conversation and then they can sit there and they can talk about how things are personally affecting them, it kind of creates an, an energy in this space. And it says to the men in the room, to the boys in the room, this is in fact a safe and brave space. And for you to share in here does not mean that you're going to be judged and that you're going to be less than fill in the blank. There's a disproportion um, in terms of the number of men and women that are facing charges before the courts. Is there a link with the trauma, the male, the over hyper male uh, attitude and crime? Um, I think in, in a lot of ways how certain expectations of how young boys or, or men or young women or, or women are, are kind of expected to deal with hardship, expected to deal with trauma, um, kind of broadly speaking, it's a little bit more socially acceptable for women to deal with it in what I would call kind of healthier ways, whereas with men, 
there's this wall that comes up and, and it's almost as if if you are to show how this affects you like you will no longer have status within your community as a man and so i think over time we have to put or pay particularly close attention to how those repressed feelings are sort of then bottled up and coming out in violent ways so if i'm seeking how are they coming out in violent ways well i think um you know thinking about within the context of trinidad within the context of our community back in the u.s um there's there's what almost feels like a hole that's left within these young men because of the pain and not dealing with it and so they're they're seeking that sense of what does it feel like to be loved what does it feel like to find that sense of belonging a family and a community and so sometimes the easiest routes are choosing a gang or choosing a group of, of men that might not be partaking in the healthiest activities but that to them is that sense of belonging that they're seeking and not receiving in the family so and the female conversation, and I don't mean to, to stereotype this, to ask or oh, ask all the questions about the male, but are, are women challenging this? To how do we tell our men we have to talk? Well, Is it easy for a woman to do that? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head in that women also have a role here, both as Austin was saying how men can create spaces for other men to open up. Also, women have a role in terms of how we are putting pressure on you know our partners on how we're raising our children as mothers and so if we too are pushing them to act a certain way limiting their ability to um, express emotion or process things in, in healthy ways as as Austin was saying then we, we may also be contributing to to them feeling like they only have a narrow bandwidth which in they can operate in and also women do have those other ways of um, engaging that are a little more gender socially acceptable in terms of like talking things out when something happens. What is the end game of this conversation that you're having? What are you hoping to do to Trinidad and Tobago, with Trinidad and Tobago society? Uh, I think that it's it's a work in progress. I mean, we're we're really interested in in supporting the work that's already being done in the community um, and also learning from it. As as Austin was saying too, there are a lot of parallels with. Uh, even though the cultures are very different, as you were saying, the Caribbean macho man exists here, um, but we do have parallels in the United States as well, and we've seen in our research in other countries. So, so supporting folks as they continue this, this exploration of what could allow to address some of these underlying issues that might be contributing to problems in society. So what do you want to tell the men out there who may be a little unsure as to how to deal or to ventilate their emotions? Um. If I could say one thing, I think that we have to, to know that it's okay to be ourselves. It's okay to, to realize that we have an identity that is our own to hold and we have a voice. And yes, there's a ton of pressure to perform, to have to live up to that standard. But that at the end of the day, um, as life goes on, as I've seen younger men um, go through the pain of making the mistakes of, of being in prison for tw 10 or 20 or 40 years, that afterwards there will be this moment of almost wishing, I wish I would have been my authentic self at an earlier point. Easier said than done, but I think it starts with how do we have conversations about what does it look like to redefine masculinity in a healthy way? Redefine masculinity in a healthy way. How, and let's talk about the rest of your program here. When are you gonna return? How is this all going to end? <laughs> we're gonna be um, here for at least another week. Um, and and then we're going to continue to work. Like I said, we've we've had some phenomenal local partners, and they've already invited us back to continue these conversations, both around local global partnerships and around men and masculinities. So you can get more information. All of the information is on the screen. If you would like to contact uh, the organizers as well as maybe even contribute to the body of research, because it is all about advancing policy and influencing uh, governments and decision makers to understand that it's not just about the soldiers, the guns, and the police. But there are soft issues which also need to be dealt with and addressed frontally if we are to combat the crime situation. We take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more for you. Stay with us. This is The Morning Room.